Messiah was coming at last. Now this was momentous news in first century Palestine because many people had been waiting for years, for centuries, for a Messiah who would rescue them from the endless burden of living under successive and often tyrannical empires. Now Matthew notes just a few things about John, his appearance, his clothes were made from camel's hair, his simple but his nourishing diet consisted of locusts and wild honey, and his method of delivery. He spoke loudly and courageously, preaching a message of judgment mixed with mercy as he announced to the world that the course of history was about to change with the coming of the kingdom of God. Here's something of what John says about uh, Jesus in Matthew 3, which should be on PowerPoint 3, the third one. That's okay, it doesn't matter, but it's not going to work, it's fine. Okay, yeah. Right. Prepare the way for the Lord, he shouted. Now, this isn't just any Lord, this is the Lord, the Messiah of Israel. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He's so much greater than I am. Why? I'm not good enough even to carry his sandals. He has his winnowing shovel, which he'll use to thresh out all the grain, and he will gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn the chaff in a fire that never goes out. Now, this is the language of judgment mixed with the language of mercy, and this in itself is a major study, and this is not what we're going to concentrate on today. However, John the Baptist's ministry, his lifestyle and his message reminded folk of the lifestyle, the ministries and the message of Old Testament prophets. And of course, we know that up to this point in history, there had been no prophetic voice for 450 years. That is since the days of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. And if we think about it, this is like going back to the reign of Queen Elizabeth I and her successor, James VI and I. So it was a long time. So here was John functioning as the prophetic link between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, one in the same God, bringing God's kingdom to earth only this time revealed through Jesus of Nazareth, whom John was identifying as the Messiah. And at the end of, jo of chapter three in Matthew's gospel, John baptizes Jesus and then he disappears from the narrative. And there follows six chapters in Matthew which record the teaching and the activities of Jesus, King of the Kingdom. Next slide. Then in Matthew 10, Jesus gathers 12 disciples around him in 10, one to four. He sends them on a lifelong mission of telling people that the kingdom of God had come and Jesus spelled out to his disciples all the things that were expected of them as kingdom workers. Now included in chapter 10 are warnings about the various forms and the extent of the opposition and the persecution that would come as a result of being kingdom people. So Jesus did not coerce people into becoming his followers, but he made it very clear from the start that there would be a cost, sometimes a very high cost, to being a follower. Next slide. And then we reach chapter 11. Matthew tells us that Jesus set about teaching and preaching in the towns of Galilee. 
Mahi then provides a snippet of information that keeps us in touch with how things are going with John the Baptist. Now, if you have a Bible in front of you, it might be helpful, but I'm going to have a PowerPoint going at the same time. Matthew 11, 1 and 2. Here's a snippet of information. John is in prison. We're told simply that he's in prison, nothing else, but we know he's in prison in a place called Machairus in Perea. That is a hundred miles from where Jesus is in Galilee. That's a three or four day walk away. And at this point in the story, we're not told why John is in prison, but he's in Herod's prison and Herod's palace was in Machairus in Perea. And so the prison was attached to the palace. However, in John chapter, in Matthew chapter 14, we have an explanation there that John had been thrown into prison because of his outspoken, ex, his outspoken opposition to Herod's affair with his brother's wife, whom he wanted to marry. But it was against the law of Moses for a woman to marry her brother-in-law while her husband was still alive. Now here's the point. The point was that the Herods were meant to be the shepherds of Israel. They were meant to be Israel's spiritual guides. But here they were engaged in a major moral scandal and so John kicked up a fuss. In today's world, John would no doubt be regarded as an ultra conservative or as a self righteous bigot. And his attempts at damage limitation for God's sake and for the sake of Israel's moral and spiritual standing in the world landed him bound and in jail and facing severe punishment for his trouble. and languishing in the darkness and the squalor of Herod's jail for perhaps a year or more gave John plenty of time to think about the wretched nature of his circumstances. And we're told that things only got worse for John as he eventually paid the ultimate price for standing up for what was right, as recorded in Matthew 14 and uh, his sickening execution provided gruesome entertainment for the Herods. And at the beginning of, of this story, the beginning of the Jesus story, John was so alive, so certain about his mission, so confident about who Jesus was and about his own role in Jesus' kingdom ministry. And now listen again to what he tells people about Jesus at the start of chapter three. Next slide, please. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not fit to carry, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John must have heard what the voice of God from heaven said about Jesus at his baptism. This is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. So from the start, John was the courageous witness to this seismic event at the beginning of Matthew's story. But look at him now. Things could not get much worse. Next slide, please. John's present circumstances don't match the expectations he set out with at the start of his mission. A mission which promised blessings on those who repent and fierce judgment for those who don't. And disastrously for John, not only has the course of his life taken a dive, but the blessings for repentance and the judgment for unrepentance 
seem to be totally reversed. So John spends his time in jail thinking. In fact, probably the only thing he could do in that jail was think. Apparently his friends were allowed to visit him in prison, so it's clear that he was kept up to date with what Jesus was doing. But he's thinking. So he sends his friends to Galilee with a momentous question for Jesus. Next slide, please. Are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? And the question implies that John was surprised by Jesus' style of ministry. Was it something to do with his preconceived ideas about what the Messiah should be like? After all, the fierce judgment promised by John at the beginning of the ministry was not at all obvious now. So far as John could see, Jesus had not produced any baptism of fire and no casting away of the wicked into a furnace of fire. No, Jesus was not at all carrying out judgment on enemies, nor had he done anything about the scandal in Herod's court. Instead, he's concentrating on healing and helping people, reaching out to the weak and the marginalized in society and bringing the good news to the poor. In fact, Jesus' concern for the helpless and the unimportant people in the communities of Galilee resulted in a much more low-key image than John may have been hoping for. Most likely, John had expected, like everyone else, that the Messiah would be more of a military man, that he'd get rid of the Romans, and the kingdom of God in a utopian peace and joy would fill the earth. But no, Caesar was still on the throne of the empire. He was still in control and John's fate was still in the hands of Herod, the very same Herod who eventually presided over the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus. Surely, surely all this was not part of God's big plan. And so the question stood, are you the one who was to come or should we look for another? So what are we to make of all this? There's an implied Firstly, an implied doubt, an implied rebuke in John's question. Why, Jesus, are you not getting on with the job messiahs are supposed to do? Why are you not ousting the enemies of God's people and letting us live in peace? Why are you doing nothing about the scandal that's hit Herod's household? And why am I in this jail upholding justice and righteousness and you're not doing a thing about it? And the tone of his question suggests that John's experience did not match his expectations of the ways he thought God should work. Why shoot yourself in the foot, Jesus, and see off your greatest supporter just when the kingdom was getting started? The reality is that John would not be human if he didn't wonder why. If Jesus was the Messiah of God, did he not at least get him out of the jail? You know what? I think we all ask questions like this. If God is God, why can't things be different? Why can't things run more smoothly? Why can't we step in and do the sensible thing and get the world out of its mess? Why can't he get me out of my mess? 
And then secondly, there's an implied doubt in John's question. Are you the one? And by the way, if you are the one, why am I still in this jail? Some commentators suggest that John began to doubt. John the Baptist doubt? An oxymoron, if ever there was one. The thought of being executed for the sake of righteousness and justice was one thing, but the thought of being wrong about the identity of Jesus was quite another. If John had got that wrong, his life's work was in vain. So from the dreary darkness of Herod's jail, it must have been very easy for John to lose the sense of certainty and confidence that he had at the start. So he asked his question, are you Jesus of Nazareth, the one? Doubt and uncertainty with God and the way he's supposed to work is a subject that we rarely talk about in church circles. In fact, I go as far as to say that if I dare express doubt about any aspect of Christian faith or the way God works or doesn't work, would I not be regarded with a certain amount of suspicion? Would the sincerity and the validity of my faith not be seriously questioned? After all, if I'm a believer, why would I doubt? Lee Strobel, next slide. Um, the American author and the investigative journalist. He's a, an atheist turned Christian who wrote The Case for Christ, says this. Many people think that doubt is the opposite of faith and that doubt has no place in the life of a Christian. Not true. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. Strobel defines unbelief as the conviction that what God has said is not true, or what the Bible says about God and his activity is not true. But that's not the same as doubt. Doubt has been defined as the inner uncertainty, usually, but not always, caused by the circumstances or the sorrows of life. Something bad happens to us or to someone dear to us, so we begin to doubt. We doubt God. We doubt his word. We doubt God's ability to see us through the tough situations of life. We doubt whether he knows or understands our problems, what we're going through in life, our suffering. We doubt whether he really cares for us at all. And so we question him, Lord, what is all this about? Are you really the one who is in control of all things? Have you ever had thoughts like that? I have. Those who doubt and struggle with the big issues in life are in great company. Abraham doubted. Sarah doubted when she laughed at God. Job constantly argued with God. The Psalms are full of expressions of doubt and despair, wondering where God is. Peter and the other disciples doubted. Thomas doubted. Many characters in the Bible doubted or struggled with God, but their names can be found in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. Many people struggle with doubt, but does that mean they lack faith? Doubt looks for God, wrestles with God, asks difficult questions, Unbelief walks out, ignores God, turns its back on God, throws the baby out with the bath water. 
someone else has said this, struggling with God through questions and sometimes through many tears is not a sign of lack of faith, but of a live faith. And so there was John, this rough, tough, prophetic giant, now he's sitting in jail, anxious, worried, thumping heart, wondering, had he got it all wrong? Had he made a huge mistake? When you and I go through tough times or periods of doubt or both, we need friends who will walk with us. And when you see others going through tough times or struggling with doubt or gutted because of life, or life's experiences. Walk with them. Go the extra mile. Or like John's friends, the extra 200 miles. And in this post-COVID, I hope, world, where there are more lonely, doubting people than ever before, we all need the support and the encouragement of friends like John's who express their love for John by spending time and effort to encourage him when he needed, needed it the most. Sometimes love is spelt T-I-M-E. And then how did Jesus respond to John's question? Verse 4, Matthew 11. He said this. Go back and report to John what you see and hear. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. And woven together in this simple reply is a collection of Old Testament texts mainly from Isaiah 35 and 61, which were clearly fulfilled in the deeds done by Jesus in the previous chapters of Matthew's gospel. John would recognize these, and Jesus was affirming to John that the way his ministry has unfolded up to this point in Matthew is exactly in line with Old Testament promises made by the prophets. This was a radical way of expressing God's love to the world, but rooted in Old Testament promises. In other words, Jesus is telling John that what is being reported to you is the evidence that the Messiah is here. It's these acts of mercy, unexpected as they were to John, which marked Jesus as the true Messiah of God. So John, Jesus has not got rid of the Romans. That's true. He has not changed your circumstances either. But he has assured you that he is the Messiah and that his ways of working are not the ways you expected. Indeed, he has introduced a way of life and a lifestyle for all of his disciples to follow and which results in the transformation of lives and communities as evidence of the way God works for the good and for the blessing of all peoples. And what about us? We need to be honest when dealing with some of life's circumstances which cause us to question. If John the Baptist can raise questions and doubts, so can I. If John needed help to get through his tough situation, so do we. Surely one of the great blessings of being part of any church family is people who will encourage and help and support one another through the situations that baffle our expectations. And there are many of those. Lord, I do not know why you have allowed this to happen. And you can fill in the blanks yourself. And one more thing before we finish. 
As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to talk publicly about John. And he said this, what did you expect to see? Someone blown about by the media, dressed in fancy clothes as if he'd walked out of Vogue magazine? Not at all. So what did you see? A prophet. He's more than a prophet. He's the present day Elijah. My messenger, the one who has prepared the way for my coming. He's the one who set the stage for the event which changed the course of history. There's no one greater than John the Baptist. There was no criticism of John. There was no reprimand. There was only commendation. But John is still in his dirty, dark, squalid, rat-infested prison with his thoughts and his doubts waiting for the return of his friends and the answers to his question. This question was its implied rebuke and implied doubt and uncertainty. Alistair McGrath, the professor of science and religion at Oxford University said this, doubt arises partly because we feel frustrated at not being able to understand everything. John the Baptist didn't understand everything and nor do we. I'm certain that one reason Matthew records this little episode about John the Baptist and his question is not to condemn him, but to encourage his readers and future disciples like us not to be afraid of asking God difficult questions, especially in the tough times or in times of sorrow and suffering. Matthew's record also shows that Sometimes following Jesus and standing up for what is right can be a costly thing to do, not just for John, but for all of us. I don't know why John the Baptist's life ended the way it did, except that just as John was the forerunner of Jesus in his life and ministry, now he is the forerunner of Jesus in his suffering and death, as recorded in Matthew 14. It was the same Herod who presided at the death of both John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. I once heard someone say this, Jesus believes in John more than John believes in Jesus. John's questioning and doubts, his situation in life may not have changed, but they do not disqualify him from God's love and mercy. And if you remember nothing else from this talk, remember this, your doubts do not disqualify you either. Jesus believes in you more than you believe in him.